Hello, everybody. My name is Lance Ugla. I'm the chairman and CEO of IHS Market, and it's a pleasure to be here today with the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Mark, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you for the next 30 minutes, and I'm looking forward to this Sarah Week conversation presented by IHS Market. Mark, today I'd like to talk to you in this conversation, which I've really been looking forward to, about world economies, and I'm going to follow that with some questions around climate change. I know they're both uh, areas of interest for you. And to start off with your final days as the governor of the Bank of England and the impact of the decisions you had to make uh, to help counteract COVID-19 and the pandemic, how do you think we're doing as a set of global economies and global leaders in terms of the decisions we've made and the actions we've taken. Well, again, thank you for thank you for having me, um, and thanks for what you're doing. Um, the, you know, it's funny. It was it was surreal uh, in the sense of um, literally, I sort of nominally my last hour was supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, for between eleven and midnight on the Sunday night, and I was handing over to uh, Governor Bailey. Um, but literally that last hour, I was on the phone um, with, um, uh, with the G10 equivalent central banks uh, to uh, execute the swap lines that were put in place. One of many, many things that were done. It was surreal. Um, and that was the sort of tip of the iceberg of, uh, of, of various programs that were put in place. A couple of things I'll say. One is that it was much more coordinated than, you know, at the time there were sort of suggestions it wasn't uh, coordinated because it wasn't a big bang announcement of everything at one time. Um, but there was very good uh, communication about who was going to do what and who was like to do what when. We weren't in the situation that we were in 2008, which I also uh, lived through, where really keeping the system together was the first priority in order to then figure out what to do about it. And so it didn't have to be uh, nailed that way. Do I think we, uh, they, uh, uh, the authorities have done enough? I certainly think they acted with real force and determination early that very much helped market functioning. I mean, markets were able to find the price. And in terms of the financial channels, it's been very effective. And the direction of stimulus has been very effective. Right. You mentioned briefly in your, your last few words here about uh, parallels to 2008. And you were right in the middle of those as well as a decision maker. What are the key parallels? And one of the ones that I'd love you to comment on is when I look back to 2008 financial crisis, China played a real role yeah. in stimulating the economy, a substantive portion of their GDP put to work. And I understand in this uh, crisis, uh, you know, that, that amount of stimulus has been you know, much less. Do we have the right balance? Does that mean China still has more cards that they could play? and therefore we'll be able to provide incremental support from here? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One is that in 2008, uh, as, as many people know, the, you know, the financial sector itself was, was, was the problem, uh, was the core of the problem. So uh, part of the challenge was just actually getting stimulus through that sector. Uh, you know, you could put liquidity into it, you could cut rates, but actually that didn't flow through to the real economy and support. So again, then fiscal was important. I mean, of course, the central banks had to do all those things and get them right to, to, to move it forward. But uh, the fiscal side was quite important. And the China, you're absolutely right, Lance, the China uh, fiscal stimulus was exceptionally important. It was exceptionally important for commodity markets. I mean, I was in Canada at the time and the Canadian terms of trade actually improved quite substantially in 2008, which is one of the things that helped us move forward. Um, and that was because of the big spillovers from China. China's had, um, they, it's, they've had less policy room um, coming into this, uh, both on the fiscal and, um, and on the, on the uh, monetary financial side. There's been a um, part, part of the challenge of success quite often is uh, the degree of financial innovation you get on top of that and the so-called shadow banking sector in China had, had grown quite substantially the last several years. They've been taking steps to manage that down, but then that meant a certain stance of policy. It's still very early days in this because we're still, for most economies, have the economy suspended effectively. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an unusual situation and it's only when it's, 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 um, those physical controls start to come off that we will see where's supply really, you know, how much quote scarring has been done to the labor market uh, and to business and, uh, and then calibrating policy from there. Right. Right. How, how do you feel the, um, you know, 2008 did a, you know, really 
super job on you know recapitalizing the banks and setting the banks on a new regulatory regime that has definitely made them a lot stronger. How do you feel um, you know in this period? Like the banks look you know super strong, well capitalized. Not a lot of articles coming out in the press that give us a lot of concern. How you know if this went on for one or two years, have we have we put the banks in that strong a position? for, you know, that forward, a, a, a prolonged economic slowdown. The absolute requirements of the banks went up almost 10 times in terms of their capital. Right. Now, so in terms of, and for UK banks, the actual capital, I mean, they were above their minimum, uh, but uh, when it has gone up four times, liquidity is up a trillion pounds in the UK uh, for the major UK banks. So, you know, much, much stronger position. We'd like to say that's prudence with a purpose, it's resilience with a reason. It's not there just to allow me to sleep, um, uh, sleep, sleep at night, uh, or, uh, or Governor Bailey or others, it's there for times like this. So one of the things that we did um, before I left um, uh, as, as, as uh, the Financial Policy Committee is that we loosened the capital requirements of the banks so that they could put some of that, those excess buffers to work. Um, and so they'd be able to lend into the, uh, into the economy. And that that has been taken off, it's there. And again, when you have the restart, uh, you'd have an expectation that that would be used as, as government starts to pull back. I mean, I don't know when that happens or how exactly they'll do it, but eventually government pulls back, you have fewer of these guarantees, the banks have the capital. I mean, they're definitely part of the solution, um, but of course the flip side, um, uh, and you think about you know whether it's in energy or uh, industrial or services is, I mean, everywhere bar tech at the moment is sitting there saying, okay, well, how am I going to invest? What's the demand outlook going to be? Um, and you need that to actually do more than just draw down on your working capital line, right? Right, right. The final one on, on the economy, when you look forward five years, um, deflation or inflation? I have a perfect answer for that in about five years' time. It will all make sense, <laughs> the wisdom of hindsight. Four square behind the stance of the central bank, Bank of England, uh, done the right thing, absolutely. And, um, you know, you make policy for the time. And you don't, you know, one thing to remember, again, for monetary policy is that, you know, your sweet spot as, as a central banker is somewhere between 18 and 24 months. Sometimes you stretch that out to about three years. But after a while, the stance fades away, whether it's right. tight or loose. And so when you get to that longer horizon, uh, it uh, would be other structural factors plus the central bank not doing its job. So the, the correct answer uh, to that question, uh, which I will now give uh, as a former central banker, is that if the Bank of England's inflation target is 2%, uh, and in the medium term, uh, shocks will you know, even out and the, the MPC will deliver 2% inflation in the medium term. Right, right. I think one of the things that I find really interesting about uh, your, your time here in the UK has been your, your thoughts around energy and energy market transition. You've taken a real stance on that. When I look at what's happening in the world right now, I, I find the world starting to divide into a camp that thinks the whole uh, concern over greenhouse gases, climate change, global warming, this is gonna slow down now. And then there's another group that uh, consider there's a real opportunity that uh, the markets actually and people in general will wanna accelerate the agenda. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, let's, let's take it up one level first, um, which is that, um, and actually I just, I mean, literally got off a uh, call with 50 uh, heads of uh, heads of state, including most of the G7 and, uh, and beyond, where some of these issues were being discussed. And when I say these issues, the phrase that gets used by some of them is, uh, let's build back better. So what is better? Um, what does society want? How do we, you know, what is, I mean, you've had, we've stopped our economies. Uh, we've had this, um, you know, existential experience and this health tragedy at the same time, affecting many people personally. Uh, but society as a whole. So as you restart your economy, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go as a society? That question is being asked everywhere around the world in, in, in all the senses, right? You, you start with what are the lessons from the COVID crisis? Well, one of them is, um, 
you know, you should have a res first job. The government is protection. You got to have a resilient economy. You, you know, you can't wish away systemic risks like a pandemic. And you know, it'd be nice to wish away climate change, but you know, you you, you can't just you know put your head in the sand and pretend it's going to go away. And then what you also see is that. You've got 125 and counting countries that have net zero as a legislative requirement. You know, that's our objective, net zero by 2050. UK, Canada, EU, the prominent examples, but many, many more. Um, and so in that environment, um, and you're resetting your medium-term economic strategy, uh, it's pretty likely that society, I mean, no guarantees in life, but it's pretty likely uh, certainly here in the UK, where uh, it, it's absolutely clear um, that uh, that's the orientation and the policy is set in that way. And companies, I have to say that the conversations with, uh, not just because of my role at the UN, but the conversations with companies, particularly in the financial sector, is that they expect that orientation towards net zero. Now, I think the key thing, and if I'll take a chance, if I do give me an extra minute here, just to reinforce something that I know you and I've discussed a bit in the past, which is that what's crucial here is this is a whole economy transition, right? It's every sector in the economy. That's the right way to go from where we are to get to net zero. What you don't want to do is try to jam everything into deep green activities as worthy as they are and the best all, every, you know, everything else is brown and bad and the best all those. It's, it's different industries moving at their pace uh, towards uh, towards that transition. And it's better to start, you know, it would have been better to start a decade ago, a little more assiduously, but you don't want to delay it. And when you sit down and fundamentally um, reassess your strategy as a company, which you pretty much have to do unless you're one of the tech companies in the sweet spot uh, of this uh, of this crisis, um, I think the question is going to be asked in a lot of jurisdictions, okay, well, well, you're doing your strategy. What's your strategy for net zero? How does that play in? And where? And then, as a provider of capital, of course, you're looking. If you're a provider of capital, you're looking at well, where's the opportunity for that? What can I fund? Uh, right. And what what risk do I need to manage? So, I think that's where it's going to land. I will say that um, there was not one. I mean, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's one meeting, but there was not one leader out of those fifty that didn't mention it. And right. normally, it's a top issue. So. Well, that's good to hear. You know, when I talk to a lot of youth, the millennials, now the Gen Zs, uh, you know, they really have a desire to see a, uh, their generation support a cleaner world. And we saw that, uh, you know, uh, in Davos this year with, you know, the primary topic in many of the agendas uh, included uh, energy transition. But do you think the, um, you know, with just these low, you know, the, the real supply oversupply of uh, oil, mm. um, lack of economic demand, and, and going back a little bit of that pace of change, you know, do you see an impact, you know, to that pace of, uh, you know, the, the shift of the clean sources? Absolutely extraordinary uh, dislocations in energy markets, um, both on the supply and, uh, and the demand side. And, uh, uh, it, it, it is quite remarkable. First point. Second point, most people know well that these energy transitions tend to take a long time. You've got installed base and it's marginal cost, not average cost that's driving it. Um, and um, so both of those work in favor of, you know, if the hydrocarbons will be you know, here for some time uh, without question. And that's why it's important to have a transition as opposed to a flip a switch from A to A to B. And we we spend a lot of time emphasizing that. I do think, though, that, you know, I mean, you, there, there's a distinction between on the power, power generation side and the, and the transportation side. Um, you know, it, one issue that a number of governments are facing or will face very soon is if they bailed out um, a heavy emitting industry like an airline, um, for example, as uh, right. some already have done, what's the quid pro quo in terms of the, the speed with which that entity, uh, when it gets relaunched, uh, moves on a path. I mean, it's hard for an airline to be net zero, but moves on that, that path, although there are some exceptions, but you know, moves on that path. So around air transport, marine transport, others, uh, you know, questions come up and you see it in some of the bailout packages. I, mean, I haven't seen the actual fine print, but certainly the announcements 
uh, some of the ones in Europe around fuel mandates. So, you know, a blended renewable fuel by a certain date, a certain proportion will be there. And, you know, that's the type of policy we, we may see. The stuff I do is not around that specifically. It's more about how do you just have the framework within the financial markets so uh, banks, insurers, uh, asset managers, asset owners have the information to make judgments around this stuff. Um, I, I guess the point being that um, certainly the, you know, the uh, low emission vehicle versus, you know, uh, internal combustion engine that, you know, on the margin, those economics have just changed with the, with the petrol price, the gas price, but uh, fuel mandates, cash, you know, if there's cash for clunkers, it's more likely to have a green tint right. to it than it did in 2008, in part because the economics are there and the installed capacity is there. Uh, uh, but, but these are some of the policy issues that will, you know, and, and, and tests, uh, to be honest, that will, will come out in the next, right. let's say, six months over the horizon. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to have a lot of, um, you know, uh, government-led programs that, uh, you know, are tied to policy to actually make sure the transition, you know, happens effectively yeah. because there's so many, you know, uh, factors that we're dealing with that, um, you know, like you, you talk about uh, EVs, I look at the, you know, the pace of change and it makes sense that that needs to accelerate. But then you have uh, gasoline prices. Yesterday, I saw them, you know, from 108 to 115 here in the UK. And, uh, but that's still a really low number. And so, you know, it's encouraging people with great policy that will help us uh, make sure this energy transition keeps pace. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's right. I mean, it kind of underscores that, um, you know, I mean, this is in the jargon is called transition risk, right? So it's where is, um, where's regulation, um, uh, where's it headed and what signal does that send to the market? And one of the big questions, so as it comes into the investing con consciousness, the lending consciousness that, hey, actually we are headed towards something like net zero. I mean, it's, it's off in the distance, but we're headed in that direction. Then you ask yourself the question for a specific industry and company You say, okay, well, what logically is gonna have to happen in that industry? So if I'm an automaker and I sit and look at um, no more internal conduct combustion engine cars in the, in the UK, 2035, something, I, I'm slightly embarrassed, it might be 2030 or 2035 for France, something like that. That tells me something about where the system's going. And then the question becomes, is it possible that's going to get pulled forward or other economic levers are going to be tweaked in that direction? Now, if you're a government, you're sitting in 2021, 2022, and you decide you want to goose your auto sector cash for clunkers or something like that, but you also have an ICE drop dead day, that it starts to influence you and, um, or at least it's a test. It's a test of, of whether you have a coherent policy. And then I, as an investor, or I, as a lender start to, you know, I look for where to, uh, where to anticipate it. I mean, I looked the other day and we can debate, we, we don't need to debate the numbers. I just think the order of magnitude is interesting that Tesla is worth more than Ford, GM, Fiat, uh, Daimler and BMW combined. Um, so you can argue, you can cut it in half and it's still, you know, that shows you the Delta of where the market at least thinks, uh, thinks the growth is. And when you're, when you've been looking at the frameworks for, uh, banks, uh, and lending portfolios, you know, the close cousins to that, of course, the asset managers have the investors and their yeah. ESG frameworks. Have you thought a lot about, you know, the data aspects of this where, you know, comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? You know, a lot of times when you're dealing with, you know, multifaceted, multifactor type yeah. analysis, getting yeah. this, these analytics right will be really, really important. Lance, you've thought more about the data aspects of this, but, but we have, I mean, we do think about it and we think about it in a couple of ways. Like one of them is, uh, as you know, the TCFD and just trying to get a, a, a basic as global as possible standard for climate related financial disclosure and flipping that from what is a private sector initiative, which, you know, it's got 140 trillion of balance sheet behind it now between the asset managers, banks, et cetera. That needs to become 
you know, put into, um, uh, you know, a disclosure regulation or listing regulation or uh, accounting standards, it, it needs to jump, you know, from the private sector has done a great job. Now it's time for the public sector to bring it in. But you're asking a much broader question and it kind of gets to the heart of ESG and, um, and the components and what drives it and, and how different um, institutions will want to use data. Um, and I think it's hugely important because first off, if you, if, if you look at it from the climate perspective or the transition perspective only, let's call that the E in the ESG. Well, most ESG indices, and there's over a thousand or so, last time I checked, are metrics, the S and the G dominate the E. So if you're trying to manage your portfolio for your millennial, or because you think there's value there using an ESG index, um, it, it's probably going to give you a false signal. There's some correlation there, but it's going to give you a false signal. Mostly social so, and governance. Yeah, exactly, most social and governance, as opposed to the uh, you know energy or, or or the climate aspect. So you're an investor or a bank. Well, okay, you're going to want to drill down on the components at least there, or at least to have the option uh, of doing that. Or if you're an index provider or other provider, and this is one of our questions we're asking of the industry, is is there a better way to really hone in on transition and transition readiness? Uh, of a company. My personal view is that these types of issues will just move more and more center stage. So yeah, it's interesting, you know, what IHS's, you know, static carbon footprint is, but where do you think it's going to go? How are you going to manage it going forward? How much is going to be of your net zero is going to be net? You're buying some offset or something versus managing down the footprint. Um, and, uh, and figuring out who's above and below the line on that is hugely important. And I, I'll just make one comment, and I think it's, I mean, it, it was slight serendipity uh, because before a major energy company uh, made an announcement uh, a few months ago of their objective to go to net zero scope three, BP, um, you know, we, we, we were pointing out this, this point that, you know, you want energy companies that are managing in this direction. I mean, Shell would be another example, Enel's another example, you know, there, there, there are, Recent Eber Droll is another example. And then you can make a judgment. What you don't want is an ESG or an index, in, in our view, for the transition or a taxonomy that just says, oh no, energy out, all energy back. Like that's, that doesn't get you what you need because anybody who spends time and your questions kind of touch on it knows that this is, a lot of this is about an energy transition and surprise, surprise, you need the energy companies to be center stage for that. Right. No, no, I'm a big proponent that we've got to make sure, you know, apples are to apples and oranges to oranges. And I, I think for investing, I see the passive investment uh, management, you know, taking a big position in the asset management space. And I think for the active managers, the ESG components are going to be a real opportunity for them to be able to perform. But as an investor, you're going to need to be able to understand yep. the measurement of that. And, and then, of course, uh, if we want to make change happen uh, in the corporate space, the frameworks you've been working on with the big banks, getting those right and measured will be really important. Maybe one final uh, question that I, I think might be very relevant to many of our audience is when you're you know, making business and strategic decisions, you look at the US, you look at China, you look at mm. your, a, a block. And it's so important uh, as we think about net zero that, you know, the G15, let's say, or the G20 is coming together, uh, yeah. you know, in harmony. And um, how do you feel we're, we're doing? What's your scorecard on that? And, uh, you know, as, as we, as we yeah. look, look forward, I want to see the, you know, world leaders come together around uh, the climate agenda. And I think we have in many, many places, but uh, what sh you're, you're closer to that action. And what do you think our, the scorecard is uh, yeah. or how we're doing as- uh, Yeah, it's, well, Lance, it's a hugely important question. You put your finger on it. I mean, uh, I, people recall that the run up to Paris, uh, there was an agreement between the US and China in September, I think of uh, the year and Paris was in November, which helped unlock the ambition for a bunch of other countries because both at the time, it was quite an ambitious agreement uh, at the time and, and, and shifted things forward. Um, the US, um, as, as you know, is um, 
uh, is leaving the COP process the day after the U.S. election. I mean, they've given notification. So that dynamic is not there um, at present, and it really is a China-EU dynamic. And the question is, will, will there be similar levels of ambition? You know, will, will they, they spur each other on? And also, and it's not just China, that should be true for anybody, but what's win-win in terms of um, uh, whether it's uh, technology flows, whether it's capital flows, what, this is one of the possibilities, I think, is that some of the markets can be knit together, including carbon, uh, uh, you know, offset markets, other markets there, uh, which would provide an opportunity. Now, literally, you know, we're recording this uh, just, uh, you know, so in, in real time, um, uh, the, uh, the EU's released their um, latest variants on the uh, Green Deal, um, which uh, is more ambitious than it was coming in. Um, long process still to come, but you know some of the some of the elements are being put in place there. You can see I want to end sort of glass half full here because the other I'm going to turn a negative into a positive in that. Uh, there are there are tensions in you know the relationships uh, 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 as, as there often are between large large economies large countries, but there is there is at the same time there's a need for places for constructive engagement, and this is a place for constructive engagement. And you know just step back, China biggest producer of electric vehicles in the world, you know one of the biggest installed renewable bases in the world. Um, it's run by engineers. Um, who understand this stuff, you know, there, there is real potential there. And I know that um, in my dealings with the Chinese in the past, at the, whether it's the PBOC or up to the prime minister, um, always, always, always on this issue, uh, both on the energy side and the, and the capital markets connection to it in a very sophisticated and sort of outcome oriented way. So that can turn. You put your finger on That's one of the keys to unlocking a successful you know, successful call process. Right. Yeah. And with that delayed, uh, the, uh, the cop this year being delayed, when will the, when, when is the next date that it'll be uh, set for? Is well, that the, um, I mean, we don't have a date. Uh, it's postponed for obvious reasons and it was postponed for the right reason, which is, um, to keep the ambition high. I mean, you know, people do things virtually now. So I guess in theory, you could have had a, uh, you know, several thousand person virtual meeting, um, but um, it was to keep uh, the ambition high. Now, the EU-China process uh, is still on track. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not directly involved in it, but there's a meeting in um, September, October in Leipzig, which is a key summit. And then what we're doing on the bit that I have greater visibility, which is on the private finance side, is we're putting in place kind of interim milestones so that some of these building blocks are, are put in place. We're not, what we're not going to do is save up stuff. You know, we find out when COP is and we'll save it up and we'll announce when we get there. Uh, particularly, I mean, this is the great thing about working with the private sector is if you work with people and say, okay, we need this and we all agree and they work on it. Once they have it, they want to implement it. They're not going to, you know, put it in their back pocket, which is right. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll, we'll make some progress, but in the end, in the end, I, all that said, you know, it's a negotiation uh, in, in the end. Many aspects of COP are negotiation. And so you do need that deadline for the negotiation to get closed. And, you know, when we, when we have a new date, that will mean certain things right. only get gripped at, at, at the end. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I've got one personal uh, question. Well, actually two uh, quick ones uh, to wrap us up here. But uh, the last book you've read or... The, the pandemic book, what's the one that uh, you're recommending? That I'm recommending? Yeah, yes, something, something that you've read in the, uh, the last uh, few months that uh, I read, okay, I'm gonna give our two audience to pick up. I shouldn't say terrible answer, I'm gonna give two, it's a straight answer, fiction, uh, nonfiction. Uh, I read uh, Cass Sunstein's uh, Cost Benefit Revolution, a brilliant guy, one of the best uh, economists, public policy, uh, and uh, it's very good and actually, it turns out, I didn't read it for this reason, but there's a lot in there about value statistical lives and things like that, which are relevant uh, sort of thing. I'm reading the last of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Thomas Cromwell, uh, you know, the, uh, the Light in the Mirror by uh, Hilary Mantel, which is, uh, I may need an extension on the pandemic to get to the, 
<laughs> it was a long time to get to it. I would have thought I would have finished it by now. Okay, great. And then finally, as a uh, fellow Canadian, uh, I hope you uh, choose ice hockey over basketball, but uh, some oh, told me yeah. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. That might, so, first off, as a fellow, as between two Canadians, we don't even have to have the ice in there. Uh, <laughs> it's hockey. And, uh, you know, I was very, look, I was happy for the Raptors and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I would rather watch, yeah, hockey, hockey, hockey all the time. Thanks, Mark. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Next year, let's try to do this in person. And until then, be safe, you and your family, friends and colleagues. I wish you all well. Thank you for joining the Sarah Week Conversations presented by IHS Market. Oh, my pleasure.